Chapter 7, Odd Number Problems 1 through 11. Number 1, describe the distribution of sample means, its shape, expected value, and standard error. For a sample of 100, select it from a population with a mean of 40 and a standard deviation of 10. From our reading, we've learned that if a distribution has a sample greater than 30, then the distribution sample means will be normal. So in this case, given that n is equal to 100, we can assume that the distribution of sample means is normal. Consequently, the expected value of m would equal mu. Again, this is because n is greater than 30, right? n is greater than 30, so the distribution is normal. So the expected value of m is equal to mu. So in the first one, we're asked um, to determine the shape, the expected value, expected value of m, to be more precise, and the standard error. So again, now we've concluded that the shape is normal. As a result, the expected value of m would equal the mu, which in this case is 40. And then finally, we're asked to calculate the standard error of the mean. Standard error of the mean. And we've learned that the standard error of the mean is equal to the standard deviation divided by the square root of n. Before I go any further, we should recall that the definition of standard error of the mean is as follows. The standard error represents the average difference between sample means and the population mean. So similar to how we understand standard deviation, here I'll put our mean, and we have a standard deviation, let's say it's equal to 10, and the mean is equal to 100. Uh, when we're talking about standard deviation, again, it's in relation to x values. So you can envision x values surrounding the mean. And the standard deviation simply represents the average difference between the scores and the mean. So we would note that this score deviates from 100 a certain amount, this one from 100 a certain amount, similarly over here. And the standard deviation simply represents the average difference. So in other words, in this distribution, these scores in this distribution deviate from the mean by 10 points. Similarly, standard error represents the average difference between sample means and the population means. So same concept, but instead of working with x values, we're talking about sample means. So if we take a distribution, it has a mean, and this distribution, the population is made up of several sample means. Okay, so again, now we're just moving into the, the application of samples. And again, the reason for this um, shift is because we would never conduct ex an experiment using one person, one x value. We're going to take a collection of x values and, and administer a treatment and then measure the mean of that sample. So again, similar, we would see that this mean differs from that. Um, population mean and above and below. Again, obviously there'd be multiple sample means. But now we understand standard error of the mean represents the average difference between sample means and the population mean. All right, so now we can, given our understanding of what we're calculating, always essential to understand the concept before you do the calculation, we can now solve for standard error of the mean. So standard error of the mean is equal to our standard deviation in this case, which was equal to 10, and the square root, but divided by the square root of the sample size, which is 100. So essentially that's 10 over 10. 10 divided by 10 gives us 1. So again, how we would interpret that is that in this distribution of sample means, each sample mean deviates from the population by one point. Okay, so again, we have our distribution, the expected mu, right? Um, or we would use 
here in the center. Again, the expected value of m is often thought of or understood as the mean of sample means. So I'll write that um, in just a second. But here, the mean of sample means. And, and then we would take all our sample means. And now what we've calculated, the standard error of the mean is equal to 1. We're saying that on average, all of these sample means deviate from the mean of sample means, the average of all sample means, which would equal mu, right? They all deviate on average by one point. Okay, so let me go back and write this idea of what the expected value is equal to. The expected value of m equals mu. It's also understood as the mean of sample means equals mu. So in other words, if we were to take the average of all the sample, all the possible sample averages, and averaged all of those, we would get the population mean. And that should make sense. Uh, it should be logical because all those sample averages represent the entire population. So again, if we were to take the all the sample means, average all the sample means, it would generate the equivalent of the population mean. Number three, the distribution of sample means is not always a normal distribution. Under what circumstances is the distribution of sample means not normal? Again, the key, when is it not normal? So, the dist from our reading, we've learned that the distribution of sample means will not be normal if the population from which samples were drawn is not normal. And, and it's important, and if n is less than 30. Okay, in other words, if we have an original population distribution that's either positively or negatively skewed, and we take samples from that skewed distribution, if our sample size, right, is less than 30, right, if then the, the creation of the new distribution of sample means will not be normal. However, if, so again, the distribution, so we take our original population distribution, we take several samples, all the sample sizes are less than 30, then the distribution of sample means will be skewed as well. If, however, n is greater than 30, right, greater than 30, regardless if the original distribution, this is what I'm talking about over here, the original distribution is skewed, if we take multiple samples, and as long as n is greater than 30, then we will generate a normal distribution, a symmetrical distribution. So the mean of means is in the center of the distribution. So again, the question focusing on when is it not normal? So it is not normal if the samples um, are taken from a skewed distribution and if those samples are all smaller than 30. Number five, for a population with a mean of 70 and a standard deviation of 20, how much error on average would you expect between the sample mean and the population mean for the following sample sizes? Again, what we're solving for is standard error of the mean. Notice this is just another definition of standard error of the mean. Here they've indicated the average error. Same thing as what I had indicated in the first problem, the average difference between sample means and the population mean. Here they're just expressing it as average error. So we know that we're solving for standard error of the mean, which is the standard deviation over the square root of n. So we're going to use that equation for each of these examples, and all that's changing is the sample size. So in this case, 
um, we would calculate standard error of the mean. The standard deviation is equal to 20 and that would be divided by the square root of n. In this case n we were told is equal to 4. So that becomes 20 divided by 2 and that's equal to 10. Again standard error of the mean is equal to the standard deviation 20 divided by the square root of our sample size 16 so 20 divided by 4 gives us 5. And then finally, standard error of the mean is equal to standard deviation of 20 divided by the square root of 25. So we get 20 divided by 5, and we get 4. And something important to um, recognize here, as, as sample size, as n increased, standard error decreased. And that should make sense that if we have larger samples, right, then our samples are going to be more representative and there could be, there's going to be a, a, a smaller expected error between the sample statistic and the population um, parameter. So this is a very important relationship that as n increases, the standard error of the mean decreases. Okay, so again, taking into account the equation, you should, again, always think about that relationship that as this increases right as this increases increases sorry about that let me give myself a little bit more room as n increases the standard error standard error decreases. Mathematically that should make sense. Again, as n, as we had larger n's, we went from 4, 16 to 25. As that increased, we saw that the standard deviation decreased. Okay, so keep that relationship in mind as we move forward with these concepts. Number seven, for a population with a standard deviation of 12, how large is a sample is necessary to have the standard error that is less than four points. All right, well, let's again identify what we know. We know standard deviation is equal to 12, and um, we want to find out what we're, we're charged with figuring out is what size of n do we need to produce a standard error of the mean that's less than four points. So those are things that we know. Now, as I always indicate it's um, best to use to ground this um, information in an equation. Obviously we're, we're looking at a standard deviation or standard error, excuse me, and it's um, how it's related to standard deviation and sample size. So what I'm going to do is simply use our equation for standard error and replace variables. Okay, so standard error of the mean is equal to the standard deviation over the square root of n. Um, again, the standard error of the mean, right, we don't have that exactly, but we do have um, a starting point, and that starting point is 4. So again, we, we can use this equation and use 4 as the basis of figuring out how large of a sample is needed to produce something that's um, close to 4. In fact, less than 4 is, is the um, ultimate objective. So let's just use 4 as a starting point. So 4, we replace variables. 4 is equal to standard deviation, which is 12, divided by the square root of n. And again, n is what we are hoping to figure out. So if we move variables around, we would then um, recognize that the square root of n would be equal to 12 over 4. Okay, and then given that, we would conclude, uh, I'm going to move up this way, n square root of n is equal to 3. Okay, and, and to figure out what n would equal, we would obviously square the 3, so n would equal 3 squared, so n is equal to 9. Okay, but again, the answer is not just 9. Um, because 
of the fact that we are looking for a standard error that's less than 4. Again, given the last example, remembering the relationship as n increases, standard error decreases. So what I've um, solved here is what n would equal if standard error were equal to 4. But again, the task was to figure out um, what is n equal to if we want to produce a standard error that's less than 4. So, in other words, um, in order to produce standard error less than 4, n must be larger, greater than, or larger than 9. Because if n is equal to 9, then standard error is equal to 4. We've established that with the equation. But the question was, what size of n will produce something less than 4? So our final answer would be that n, right, must be greater than 9. Okay, so our final answer would be n would be greater than 9. Okay, so using that same method, we're going to solve the next one. So what um, size of sample will produce a standard error less than 3 points? So again, standard error less than 3. We're going to use that 3 as the basis to solve our equation and then draw conclusions using the relationship between n and standard error. So standard error is equal to to the standard deviation over the square root of n. We're going to replace variables again using that 3 as a start, starting point. So 3 is equal to 12 divided by the square root of n. If we move variables around, we recognize that the square root of n is equal to 12 divided by 3. I'll move up here. So therefore, square root of n is equal to 4. To figure out what n is equal to, we would take n is equal to 4 squared, n is equal to 16. So um, what we've just concluded is that if n is equal to 16, standard error will equal 3. But again, the task is to find out what n must equal to produce something less than 3. So similar to what we concluded in the previous example, our final answer would be that n, n must be greater than 16. Because again, we recognize that the relationship between the standard the sample size and standard error is as follows. As n increases, standard error decreases. So we know at minimum, if n is equal to 16, standard error will equal 3. We want something less than 3, so in order to achieve that, we have to have a sample size greater than 16. Number 7c, similar process. Um, so again, we're trying to figure out what um, a standard error that's going to be less than 2 points. So we're going to use the same process, 2 as the base, um, the base of using our equation. So standard error is equal to standard deviation over the square root of n. Replace variables. Again, let's just solve for if standard error is equal to 2. Standard error is equal to 2. Um, excuse me, 2 is equal to 12 over the square root of n. And then if we Simplify this. Again, we move variables around. The square root of n is the same as 12 over 2. So the square root of n is equal to 6, and therefore is equal to 6 squared. So we would conclude that n is equal to 36. And again, if n is equal to 36, we will produce the standard error equal to 2. But our task was to find the value of n that will produce a standard error less than 2. So again, as we saw in the previous examples, n must be greater than 36. So our final answer is n must be greater than 36. 
If n is greater than 36, we'll produce a standard error that is less than 2. Before we finish with this, let, let me just um, end this series of examples with um, replacing variables to, to illustrate what, what exactly I'm doing in case that you don't see this. So if n, let's say n, right, we're saying that n must be greater than 36. So let's say it's equal to 37. So let's figure out what standard error would equal. So standard error would equal standard deviation over the square root of n. So standard error is equal to 12 over the square root of 37. Again, greater than 36. So in your calculators, go ahead and enter 12 divided by the square root of 37. So 12 divided by the square root of 37. And you should get standard error is equal to 1.973. If we round, three digits right of the decimal. Again, what was the test? We wanted to find out what sample size will produce the standard error less than two points. We use this just as an example. 37 is greater than 36. My final answer is n must be greater than 36, so I tried 37. 37 produced a value less than 2. Okay, number 9. For a population with a mean of 80 and a standard deviation equal to 12, find the z-score corresponding to each of the following samples. So again, we've learned that z for sample means is equal to m minus mu divided by the standard error of, of um, the mean. All right, so we have sample size and we have our mean. What we don't have is our standard error. So let's begin there. So our standard error of the mean is equal to standard deviation over the square root of n. We replace variables. So standard deviation is equal to 12 over the square root of n, in this case 4. So standard error of the mean is equal to 12 over 2. Standard error of the mean is equal to 6. And now that we have that, we can calculate our z-score. So z is equal to the mean, in this case 83, minus the mean of the population, 80. So this was sample mean, 83 is sample mean, 80 is the population mean. And then divide by the standard error of the mean, which is equal to 6. And we get a z-score of 0 0.50. All right, similarly, next one, we need to calculate our standard error of the mean. So we take our standard deviation, divide by the square root of n, which in this case is 16. So the standard error of the mean is equal to 12 divided by 4, and that gives us 3. We can use that to calculate our z-score. So the mean of 83 sample mean minus population mean 80 divide by the standard error of the mean in this case 3 and we get 1 and then finally the um, 9c standard error of the mean is equal to standard deviation 12 divided by the square root of n in this case 36 so standard error of the mean is equal to 12 over 6 which is equal to 2. We can use that in our z equation. z is equal to a score of 83. Um, sample mean minus population mean, 80. And divide by standard error of the mean, not 6. <laughs> it should be 2. And we get 1.50. So again, what we've just concluded that in 9a, a sample mean equal to 83 is half a standard error unit above the mean when the standard error of the mean is equal to 6. Um, when the mean is still 80, so again, the constants are the sample mean, 83, for all three examples. What's changing is sample size. And as a result, the standard error is affected. So in the next example, we're saying the sample mean of 83 is now one standard error above the population mean. And the reason it changed is because n changed to 16. It increased. Now the standard error for the, for the last one is equal to 2, and we're saying that a score of 83 is one and a half standard error units, one and a half standard error units above the population mean. 
So this score is now further out. It's further out in the distribution as a result of n increase. And so again, this example um, reiterates this relationship of as n increases, standard error decreases, standard error decreases, and now the new pattern we see and z-score, so as n increases, standard error decreases, and z-scores increase. So again, we are adding a new element to this relationship. As n increases, standard error decreases. If we're dividing by a smaller number, here 6, now 3, and then finally 2, notice the effects on the z-score. The z-score is larger, meaning that the sample mean is being pushed out further into the tail. So again, we have 0.5, 1, and then 1.5. So again, that's not really a, a good scale, but we see that this same sample mean of 83, that hasn't changed, but its location has been significantly affected simply by increasing sample size. So keep that in mind. That's something important to um, understand and apply as we move forward with our hypothesis test. Number 11, a normal distribution has a mean of 60 and a standard deviation of 18. For each of the following samples, compute the z-score for the sample mean and determine whether the sample mean is, is a typical representative value or an extreme value for a sample of this size. So we're going to need our standard error of the mean equation. Standard error of the mean is equal to standard deviation of the square root of n and our z equation. z is equal to m minus mu divided by standard error of the mean. So we'll begin with calculating our standard error of the mean. Standard error of the mean is equal to 18 over the square root of 4. Standard error of the mean is equal to 18 over 2. So we can conclude that standard error of the mean is equal to 9. Given that value, we can calculate the z-score. z is equal to the mean of 67 minus the mu of 60. And given that difference, we should expect a positive z-score divided by the standard error of the mean, which is 9. So take 67, 67 in your calculators, minus 60, divide by 9, and we get point, we get point seven 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 seven, and on and on and on. But because our z-scores are reported two digits right of the decimal, um, let's continue with that standard. So given the value on your calculator display, you should round to 0.78. 0.78. And again, the um, rationale is that our unit normal table expresses z-score as two digits right of the decimal. So this will ensure that you look at the correct z-score when you're looking for the probability. But all we're asked to do at this point is, once we've calculated the z-score, is to label it as a typical representative score, also known as a central score, or as an extreme value. And again, there's um, as we move through the chapters, we get more specific as to what defines extreme, and we'll learn how to use probability to determine that more specifically. But a black and white um, application or assessment of central versus extreme, central scores are within one standard deviation unit of the mean and um, values beyond two, positive and negative two standard deviation units, or standard error units in this case z-scores of negative 2, positive 2, would be considered extreme. So this score, 0 0.78, it's not even one standard error unit above the mean. So we would conclude that it's a typical representative score because it's centered around the population mean of 60. In other words, a, a sample mean of 67 is 0.78 standard error units above the mean of population mean of 60 not outside of that common range of positive 1, negative 1 z-score. All right, next one, same process. Standard error of the mean is equal to our standard deviation of 18 over the square root of 36. 
Okay, and again, we should consider what the effects will be. Again, the mean, sample mean is the same. That's a constant. The population mean is the same, 60, a constant. And all we're changing is increasing n. And given what we've learned um, in terms of the relationship, we should anticipate a much higher z-score because we have increased the sample size significantly. So standard error of the mean is 18 divided by 6. And standard error of the mean, therefore, would equal 3. So again, sample size increase, standard Just to take this a little bit further, I'm going to take that z-score of 0.78 and um, find the probability of obtaining um, a value, a z-score, greater than 0.78. So probability of z-score greater than 0.78. Hopefully this will um, give you a better sense of what we're talking about in terms of typical and extreme scores grounded in probability. So if we have a z-score of 0.78, that's pretty close to the mean. Um, the center of the distribution. And so if we want to find the probability of obtaining the z-score greater than 78, that would be this area here, which we refer to as the tail. And we're going to utilize our unit normal table to find out what exactly that probability is equal to. Okay, so here's our unit normal table. 0.78 is here. And the area in the tail the proportion in the tail is 0.2177. So if we go back to our problem, or just the z-score that um, we're using as an example, 
what we found is that this proportion is equivalent 0.2177. Um, the probability of obtaining the z-score greater than 0.78 right, is equal to 0.2177, or there's a 21.77% chance, right, which is a very large probability. Again, describing that that score is very common. Again, it's in relation to its chances of occurring, and um, we base it on that value or anything greater than that. The other z-score was equal to 2.33. Um, so if we illustrate that, that score is um, much further from the mean. We'll just place it here, 2.33. And again, we want to figure out the probability of obtaining a z-score that's greater than 2.33 um, to determine if it's a common score or an extreme score. So again, let's utilize our unit normal table and identify the proportion in the tail. So here's our distribution. I'm looking for 2.33. It's here. Area in the tail is 0 0.0099. So it's 0 0.0099. So the probability is point, or the proportion is 0 0.0099. Probability, the chances are 0.99%. Right. In other words. The distribution is made up of z values above 2.33. I mean, only 0.99% of the scores are above that. Or, you know, we could round up and just say 1% of all z scores appear above a z score point 2.33. Again, this is typical score because the probability is so high. And this is considered an extreme score. An extreme score is. Um, have, is, is described or understood as having very low probability. When we're doing research, our goal is to produce z values out in the tails because they show to, um, you know, they convey to us that the treatment was effective, that we have a large mean difference. And that is it for this chapters 1 through 11. Uh, next video will include the subsequent um, items from this chapter.